Good afternoon. <laughs> All right, for our uh, scripture lesson today, let's turn to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. 1 Corinthians 13. How many know what that's all about? Okay, we'll find out. All right. In the uh, chapter 13, I'm going to go right through it, and then we'll come back to it. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a tink, changing, clanging symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, and I prophesy in part. But then shall I know, just as I also am known. Now abides faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. All right, so what's the topic today? I think uh, you've already caught it, it's a four letter word love <laughs> and uh, there are a couple words we use to describe that sometimes we call it the love of god it is divine love it's a love that gives rather than having to give and then expecting something in return god gives us his love and uh, but notice here how it says that I've, even though i can do a lot of things i don't have love I'm just uh, making a sound. <laughs> a uh, sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. <clears throat> Even though I have the gift of prophecy, <clears throat> understand all knowledge, all mysteries, knowledge, <clears throat> all faith, so I can remove mountains. And that's saying quite a bit. <clears throat> but have not love, I am nothing. That sort of sinks in when I think about it. I am nothing if I have all that stuff and do not have love. <clears throat> all right, so uh, that's a good beginning of that. But first of all, I'd like to take uh, a look at the matter, well, actually verse, verse four, the very beginning. Love suffers long and is kind. All right, there is a Greek word, uh, makathume, which uh, means really to be of a long spirit and not to lose heart. In other words, uh, it is very patient. And to be patient means to be long-suffering, slow to anger, and means to be slow to punish. 
and how parents are sometimes tempted to be a little bit quick on the draw when that kid doesn't do something you want to smack them but uh, sometimes uh, we smack them too hard but anyhow <clears throat> love suffers long and is kind and it's the same thing with us uh, when people uh, sort of torment us or do things to bother us or speak about us uh, and uh, when they make uh, come out comments about our imperfections, whether they be physical or whether they're spiritual or, or mental or more, no, not mental too, well, maybe mental too. <laughs> they make remarks. Uh, we feel like just get, jumping in and answering, but we just take it and smile and just thank them for it. And that sometimes will actually convict their hearts. And uh, to means that we must uh, be long suffering, slow to anger, slow to punish, Patient with those who need to grow, and kids need to grow, and spiritual kids need to grow too. Sometimes we just say, well, why don't, don't you know any better? <laughs> well, we have to be patient with them, and uh, some of the older Christians, more mature Christians, will see that there's a lot yet to be desired with the younger ones. And uh, even with the older Christians, believe me, there's a lot to be desired. And uh, sometimes others don't notice it quite as quickly. But uh, patient with the imperfections and patient when mistakes are made. Kids will make mistakes and we as Christians will make mistakes. We're walking, we're thinking we're walking great. <laughs> All of a sudden we trip, down we go. Well, people can, I knew it. I knew they couldn't do it. No, no, we don't say that. <laughs> we just reach down with a hand and say, look, God will forgive you. And I think I mentioned this one time before here, but uh, I don't know whether you were here. I know someone, some of you weren't, but uh, my dad and mom got saved in a little free Methodist church back when I was 11 months old. So I never knew anything but a Christian home. <clears throat> but uh, my dad went home, built a beautiful uh, hen house, well, a chicken coop, and he was really proud of that. And he brought the neighbor up to look at it, and he said it was a D kind of a, a chicken coop, and of course, uh, my dad agreed with him and said the bad word. <laughs> Starts with a, with a D. Well, anyhow, when the preacher came over to visit my dad during the middle of the week, he says, how is it going, Harry? Because that was my dad's name. And maybe Mr. Bennett, he probably said Brother Bennett. Because back in the old Free Methodist churches, we used to call each other brothers and sisters. <clears throat> how many of you ever heard that song about the family of God? We call each other, yeah. Brothers and sisters around here, <laughs> we call each other. But anyhow, Brother Bennett, how are you doing? Dad said, well, not too good. And he told him about the neighbor coming up and he said, let go of that curse word. And he felt so bad about it. And the preacher just said, just ask God to forgive you and keep walking in the light. So basically all person stumbles, okay. So we get up, ask God's forgiveness and keep going. <laughs> and we're trying to please God. And it really should hurt us as Christians when we do something that displeases him. So we should make amends as quickly as we can, ask his forgiveness and keep right on going. Okay, God is patient with us. And I put down here, he's the best example. And God doesn't cast us away. Sometimes we get that idea. We, people become Christians and they say, well, I'm a Christian now, I can't do this and that. And I don't do that. And then they do it. So what am I going to do? I can't live a Christian life. No, no, you can. None of, us, none of us can live a Christian life by ourselves. It must be the Holy Spirit within us. When we invite Jesus to come into our hearts, he comes in to abide. And he'll stay there. And the Holy Spirit will, will caution. Just like with my dad. He knew he had done something wrong when he swore. And... Uh, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, that's the time to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Don't need to wait to go to, go to a priest to confess at the end of the week. Don't have to wait until you do your rosary and things like that. Just ask God to forgive you and keep on going. I don't know why I threw that in, but uh, God's patience. God is patient, he loves us, and uh, he's the greatest example of love. In fact, the Bible says that God is love. Okay, now, it also calls upon us today to be patient. 
I know uh, people say, well, we've been looking for the coming of Christ for many years. And everybody thinks he's going to come maybe today, maybe tomorrow. And since I was a kid, I mean, I'd hear sermons about Christ coming the second time, coming to take his bride. And uh, scare the daylights out of me. I said, well, I, I did some bad things, you know. I don't know whether I'm ready or not. And uh, sometimes I'd go to the altar. I was a pretty conscientious kid. And uh, I'd make sure everything was right. And uh, so uh, the scriptures does say over in Second Peter verses or chapter three verse nine, the Lord isn't really being slow about His promise, as some people think. No, He, that's God, is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. So God does not want people to be lost, but that all should repent. We know all will not and have not repented, but uh, yet, as long as we're here, we can win others to Christ. And that's part of a, that'll come in a little bit later. <laughs> all right. Now, this divine love, or this agape love, is also kind. And that comes in the next part of the sentence, uh, where it speaks about the kindness. Love is, uh, is kind. Uh, that's verse, uh, the next part that comes in the verse I just started with, uh, verse 4. Okay? Kindness means to do things, to do acts that demonstrate loving kindness or tender kindness. I think back over in the Old Testament in Psalms. Uh, the, the David the psalmist spoke of his loving kindness. I thought, what is loving kindness? Well, can you be kind without being loving? <laughs> well, you know, sometimes with children, we, uh, we're kind of snappy and mean. We really sound like we're angry with them and we're just not too kind. And yet we love them because we just reach out there and keep them from running out in front of a car. But we don't seem too kind. We start chewing them out and saying, don't you dare go across that road. Don't you know that? What do I, you know? But that's not the tender kindness, but yet it's kindness. But we just have to explain. And God does that with us, with a lot of things. He's very kind. And then also we are to follow his example. And uh, over there in uh, 1 John 3.18, uh, he s speaks to the uh, congregation. He says, my little children, <laughs> and we all, Many of us still are children in, in the, we're children of the Lord. We're a child of the King, a child of God. We are children. And he said, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Don't just go and say, you see someone has need, person is starving to death, say, oh, well, look, you just go and God will supply your needs. Not if it's in our power. <laughs> Kindness, we help them. We give them that or the money or the well of food that they needed. And uh, there's a, another translation says, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. All right. And over in Proverbs, I think of this, and I, when I think of Proverbs 31, I think about my wife. And uh, it has described her pretty good. The virtuous woman. And uh, over in Proverbs 31, 20 says, She extends a helping hand to the poor, and he, oh, she opens her arms to the needy. She's quick to assist anyone in need. She reaches out to help the poor. There's another translation. I think that's the, from the message. Uh, she reaches out to help the poor. First it said needy in the poor and then it says she opens her hand to the poor yes she reaches out her filled hands in other words the virtuous uh, good woman good wife uh, has to give to others so she reaches out her filled hands to the needy and also we realize that could also mean the body soul and the spirit somebody has a spiritual need She's ready to witness to them and help them to encourage them. And that's taken from the amplified body. So uh, 
Love looks for ways to demonstrate itself. How can we help? What can we do today? We're walking into the uh, Walmart, and as we're walking in there, we see somebody that's really struggling, trying to get her groceries out. She might be in one of those little carts and trying her best to get her groceries in the car. Maybe give them a hand, give her a hand. Uh, maybe it's just a matter of saying a word of encouragement to somebody that we uh, see that uh, looks kind of downhearted, looks blue. So uh, there are ways that we can demonstrate lo our love for others. Also, love, true love goes, I call it true. <laughs> so it's divine love, God's love, it's true love. And of course, none of you heard that song, True Love, have you? About Prince Grace. Remember that guy over Monaco? The Prince. <laughs> Years ago. Okay. True love. But anyhow, true love uh, goes beyond what people expect us to do. So, uh, briefly, uh, the kindness, the openness, well, I said it first, means doing things, doing acts that demonstrate loving kindness, loving tender kindness. And that, I guess you could say, would be a uh, po point to uh, ponder, <laughs> or uh, what would they say at the Calvary Chapel? Uh, it is a, it's one of those good points. Okay, the third, third good thing about this kind of love, it bears all things. And that also, uh, that uh, goes up to, to verse seven, the beginning of verse seven, or I believe it is bears all things. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers a multitude of sins. I used to think about that. What does it mean? Love covers a multitude. What that means, somebody can do a lot of, a lot of harm to you and can, uh, we can overlook, basically it's a matter of overlooking all the stuff, you know, not just focusing on all that they're doing wrong or all that they're doing against us, but love just Forgive them, pray for them, and uh, it actually has a meaning from the Greek word, I won't try to pronounce that now, uh, <laughs> unless you want me to. No, uh, this, this is Greek. To protect or keep by covering, to preserve, to cover over with silence. As we don't have to point out the misdoings of others. And we know today this is one of the things that uh, it seems in our United States and in this modern society, too much is done to stir up strife, to put one group of people against another or to send various groups interacting with each other, stirring up hatred. And my dad used to tell a story about a fellow when he was a kid, he would go around from one house to another and he'd spread out stories about the, the neighbors and then when they all got mad at each other, he'd just sit back and laugh. I suppose he was telling probably a bunch of lies, but he thought that was great. Well, I hope he, I hope he uh, repented of that and uh, got saved. Okay, Proverbs 10, 11. Hatred stirs up quarrels, but love makes up for all offenses. In 1 Peter, uh, chapter 4, verse 8. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. So we don't look for, for the uh, sins or the misdoings of others. And if we see them, we don't go around telling people about them or attacking them. We pray for them, real, realize that we ourselves are not perfect. And God continues to work us, uh, work great through the grace he gives us day by day to help us to uh, become more like himself, to be more holy. <clears throat> All right? That's three of the things about love. True love, God's love. Uh, next comes in there, uh, verse 7. It, uh, it believes true love or God's love kind of love that God puts into our hearts. And really we are, God, I think of God as being the greatest. He is love, <laughs> impersonated, okay? And he fills us, if Christ is within us, 
the Holy Spirit is within us, if Christ is in us, the hope of glory, and if the Holy Spirit abides within, there's God. God inside of us is love. It's how can we bring out a lot of hatred? Well, you know, we are, have a sort of a dual, dual personality. <laughs> and we still have not been totally delivered from the human. And some people like to think that we are totally perfect. As soon as they get saved and then they go on and get sanctified, uh, two works of grace, that, that doesn't. But that sanctification continues on as long as we live. We need to be purified. And uh, I'm not going to tell you where I need it. And uh, I probably still don't know every place that I need to be made holy and need correction. But I'm sure God will do the job. And if I see it in you, I'll pray that God will help you. <laughs> All right. The, uh, where was I here? Oh. Yes. 7B. Believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Well, Jesus laid down his life for us, so we should follow his example, be willing to lay down our lives for others. And people are doing that today. Pastors are doing that. Sometimes pastors become weary. Sometimes they come under attack from others that he's trying to help. And they don't realize this. And uh, because of, uh, of the human nature, uh, they oppose and they they hurt, but the pastor, I uh, I think about the pastors. I pray for pastors because I know as a Gideon, I go very, to various churches once in a while, uh, just to visit the church, get the feel of the congregation, and to get better acquainted with the pastors and, and the people. And I know one church especially where someone sat back there, and I knew that he. <laughs> I guess the term is hated the guts somehow of the pastor and his wife. I knew that there was a problem there. And uh, yet, as that pastor got up to speak and preach, as he's looking out over the congregation, you could never tell who it was. And as far as I know, I didn't remember him ever trying to slam that person. But yet he, he loves the congregation, he loves God, and regardless of how he is treated, he has to, to love others. And let the love of God, and this is why it's impossible to live a Christian life without, uh, without Christ in our lives. All right, by this we know, over in 1 John 3, 16, it says, By this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives. And I put three dots, that meant something is missing, but... And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And we do that. We do that uh, when we talk to, to others, when we uh, testify to them, we try to persuade them to uh, love the Lord and to come to the Lord. And uh, Romans 5.5 5 says, Hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts. So he pours it into our hearts first through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So we need the Holy Spirit within us to live a godly life. Okay, 1 John 3.16. It's not John 3.16, but it's 1 John 3.16. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. That's just a little way, a little different way of putting it than the one I said previously. Love also produces strong commitment. Uh, we as Christians need to be committed to uh, spreading the gospel and sharing Christ with others as much as we possibly can. I'm not sure I'm talking about pushing God down their throats, <laughs> but it's a matter of living the example and letting them see by our lives uh, that uh, we love them and also that God loves us. True love or agape love believes and makes commitments. 
All right, number five. True love also trusts. In the latter part of uh, verse seven, and the Greek word, panta elpidzai, elpidzai uh, means trust, hope, and trust means assuming the best about someone, not the worst. <laughs> and that's the thing. I wondered what that verse uh, meant for a while, and then I finally figured it out. When it speaks about trusting, loving, and believing, we want to believe the best. And we, uh, if we're wrong, then it will be proven wrong. And uh, what, we haven't suffered if that person is, uh, is not what all we assume they were. Doesn't mean we have to be ignorant and uh, be taken in there by their devices and be led astray and just be played into their hands. But it means that we still love them, we pray for them. But most of the time, and many, many times, we misjudge people by what they say or by what they do. And uh, this way, uh, by uh, believing the best, we're always safe that way. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 7. I'm going to give this to you in several different versions, okay? Uh, thir this is, all of these are 1 Corinthians 13, 7. In the uh, NIV, it says, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And from the ESV, it says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endureth all things. And the King James Version, bears all things, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. And in the NASB, it keeps every confidence, okay? <laughs> it believes all things, it hopes all things, endures all things. And then uh, in the NLT version, love never gives up. <laughs> it never loses faith. It is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. And uh, the last one, CSB, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And I saw several, I just I highlighted, it, highlighted uh, a few of those. Uh, one says it always trusts. Another said believes all things. Another said, never loses faith. And I like that also where it says, love never gives up. And so it bears all things and endures things. Uh, sort of persevering art, isn't it? Okay. Oh, that comes up to the next one. <laughs> uh, in the latter part of the seventh verse, charity Divine love, God's love, is always hopeful. And so it endures through every circumstance. Panto hupomenai, endure to preserve under misfortunes and trials. So perseverance means to stay loyal in the bad times, also in the good times. It's a matter of being loyal at all times. In fact, in 2 Timothy 2.10, uh, Paul the Apostle said this. In verse 10, uh, it's from the New Living Translation. So I am willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God has chosen. See, Paul was loyal through the circumstances that surrounded him. And we're going to look at those in just a few moments. Job said, God might kill me, but I have no other hope. I'm going to argue my case with him. <laughs> Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, Job said. That's a famous saying. <clears throat> yes, I have no other hope. He's the one I'm going to argue my case with, and he did. <laughs> and uh, 
You know, well, you may or may not know about Job, but that's interesting too. <clears throat> All right, now let me just read from to you from uh, Corinthians, <clears throat> a few verses from 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through the 20. 23 through 20, <laughs> 23 through to 30. Hey, I'm not perfect, I said 20. Uh, so it's actually starting at verse 23. Are they, here's what Paul said, are they servants of Christ? In other words, they were really putting him down. They were trying to, to make out that he was nothing, you know, and that they were, be, they were pushing themselves up and puffing themselves up to be able to be something, and they were putting Paul down. And here Paul came to his defense. I have known of pastors that sometimes have come to their own defense. And people say, well, you're bragging. No, not necessarily bragging. But if Paul the Apostle can kind of make the case for himself, I think possibly a pastor ought to at times speak up under the leadership and guidance of the Lord. But that's a personal opinion. All right. Are they servants of Christ, he asked. He said, I am a better one. Sounds like boasting, but he wasn't. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less, uh, less one. And they say that 40 will kill a person. I don't know how, what the difference is between that extra lash, but uh, 25, verse 25, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. And it ends it with saying in verse 29, who is weak, and I'm not weak. Who is made to fall, and I'm not indignant. So what he is saying is he, he went through an awful lot <laughs> and he suffered a lot because of his love for God, his, his love for the gospel, his love for people and his compassion. All right, and to Timothy, that young preacher that he uh, was guiding along uh, in 2 Timothy 2, 10 to 13, here's what he told Timothy. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we, we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, will he be faithless? No. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. We can always count on him, for he cannot deny himself. And again, as I said at the beginning of this a little bit about uh, uh, endurance, Perseverance means staying loyal in the bad times as well as the good. That's what a true friend is and a person who truly loves us. And this is God is the best example there too. Okay, for the last one, I know there are probably two or three others which I didn't get to. <laughs> true love endures, okay? Comes from mene, that's the... Uh, the Greek word it means to abide, means to continue, to dwell, endure, be present, 
remain, stand, tarry. <laughs> and I, with my translation, I would say, hang in there. Okay, so true love will hang in there with you. And others may fail, they may turn and run, and uh, some may uh, have a lot of fault to find, but if, if you love a person, uh, you can hang in there with it. And that's in verse 8, it says, love never fails. <clears throat> but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Well, I used to wonder what that meant, but when that which is perfect has come. What that meant was actually that which is complete. In other words, there was a time when uh, speaking with other tongues was very important in the church. And it says now, when the day will come when we'll all speak one language. <laughs> When you get to heaven, they'll cease. And about knowledge, it'll vanish. And uh, prophecies, we need, need, no need for prophecies. They will have been fulfilled. So, uh, all right. I put down here, yes, to get to the end of this. <laughs> Let's read the rest of 1 Corinthians. Well, I already read that. Let's go with it. Okay. When I was a child, I spake as a child. Understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. That's what it means that we're here on this earth, there will be those things. Knowledge is important. Uh, the matter of prophecy is important. And people still speak with other tongues. There's still the gift of the tongues. Some would dispute me on this, and I'm not here to dispute. But there are times when uh, people filled with the Holy Spirit, have a, sometimes they prophesy. And uh, Paul the Apostle, in the ne very next chapter, chapter 15, 14, because when I was a teenager, I, I stopped and went to a, uh, a Pentecostal kind church. And the man said, you uh, need to speak to be a Christian, to be godly, to get to heaven, you have to, you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you have to speak with tongues. I thought FP, then Q, of course I was in high school at that time, I learned later as college, FP, then Q, and if Q, then R, or something like that, uh, the matter of logic. So basically I put that together and said, well, that means in order for me to get to heaven, I've got to speak with other tongues, sometime. <laughs> well, I don't believe that, but uh, anyhow, the tongues will cease. Oh, where am I? Oh, childish things. Yeah, tongues had a, had a greater place in the starting of the church. And uh, remember how the crowds came in and these, these people who are all Jewish people were speaking different languages. People from all over the, they say all over the world, but basically from other countries came in. They heard the, oh my, the gospel. And there were what, 3,000 people converted. And I mean, that's how it started. <laughs> okay. So now, um, I lost my, yeah, I put away childish things. For now we see through a mirror, through a glass, King James Version, dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know also as I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Matthew Henry says this. Notice, I look to the uh, Matthew Henry commentary. I like that. Uh, even though I don't agree with some of all that theology, and most of the time when you look in commentaries, you won't agree with everything. <laughs> Everyone has a sort of little nuance about what they think about something. But so we go back to the Word of God, say, Lord, help me to understand that. And we keep looking until finally the Spirit tells us, we know within ourselves, Hey, I found the answer. All right. Matthew Henry said, No, these, these, those border most upon the heavenly state and perfection whose hearts are fullest of this divine principle and burn with the most fervent charity. It is the surest offspring of God. It's talking about love. 
and bears his fairest impression. For God is love, 1 John 4, 8, 16. And where God is to be seen as he is, and face to face, there charity is in its greatest height. There, and there only, will it be perfected. So love endures forever. Amen? Amen. Uh, I have brought with me some rules. Well, I'll tell you what. Did, did you notice anything about that? My going through the whole uh, chapter and I uh, left out some important parts. What did I tell you? I told you what love is, right? What love does, what it is. Describe the good things about love. It's all good. I have this with me just in case you want to see some others. There are some negative qualities, okay? <laughs> and uh, the negative qualities, all right? <clears throat> in there, I skipped over where it says, love envieth not. So love doesn't envy. If you envy other people, that's not a sign that you're loving them. You're loving them. Vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. Love is not puffed up and proud and bragging, braggadocio and boasting. And then uh, it's not puffed up. Yes, that's number three. Number four, it does not behave itself unseemly. Love is never rude. Now that's something that we can, I, most of us can help. Uh, I, I better just speak for myself. Sometimes I am rude, don't mean to be, and sometimes I just have to go ahead and Apologize. Bad manners show you don't care for the feeling of others. And then seeketh not her own, which means that uh, we're not selfish. We're unselfish enough. Pastor this morning in church spoke about that, not being selfish. In fact, he said that when you got up in the morning, uh, something to the extent of uh, living according to the Spirit throughout the day, according to God's will, not mine, not ours. Not live for ourselves, but for God and for others. Uh, number six is not easy provoked, not ir irritable, doesn't lose his temper, thinketh no evil, okay? Not resentful, not in a hurry to accuse others, but hides their wrong. Remember I said, if you see something wrong with others, um, that was the positive part of this negative. <laughs> Don't think evil, think good. And also there's another verse, whatsoever things are true. That's over in Philippians. Uh, I didn't mean to say this, but I think it will. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise. I think that's around the sixth verse of uh, Philippians 4, is it? Uh, Think on these things. <laughs> if there be any virtue, any praise, think on those things. Those are good things, isn't it? Truth, honesty, uh, all of those was, was mentioned in that verse. All right. So if you like a copy of these, uh, copy, take, uh, put them here. I could bring them back there afterwards. And also have, I, I'll tell you what, once in a while I'll look through some old books. I have an old Bible at home. I went through that Bible and I found a bunch of stuff. <laughs> and this one comes from, uh, well, some of this comes from way back. Rules for Christian Living. And uh, this is a, an excellent thing to follow. If you say, well, I'm a Christian, but somehow I just have a hard time living a Christian life. If you'll follow this, I won't go through all of them. But Rules for Christian Living, I would recommend someone or your, anyone putting it in their Bible and following it, okay? How to live a successful Christian life. Let us pray. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you this afternoon for this lovely day, for these precious people, Lord. And we pray, Father, that uh, each one of us would have gotten something from your word. And you spoke to each one of our hearts through uh, the scriptures. And Father, if this is accomplished, even one or two, we know that this time has not been wasted. So guide us, direct us, uh, 
throughout our, our lives. And may we be careful to give you praise, honor, and glory in all that we do. For we know that you made us to glorify you. We pray your blessing over them, over this congregation. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.